Good morning. My weird internet name is pronounced a bad idea. My pronouns are she, her. And what you just heard was my interpretation of these mysterious ancient tablets, specifically this bit here. But don't worry, you'll hear the rest of it. And you may be thinking, a bad idea, that's not a mysterious ancient tablet, that's a PlayStation controller. And I can explain, first a disclaimer, I am not a real linguist or a real musicologist, I'm just playing one on the internet, but I am a real computer scientist, and I have the Python scripts to prove it, but if you are an expert and you see a problem with any of the material in this video, you are probably right. Now, I'm going to make a bunch of incredibly specific claims and then try to back them up. Namely, that the three geometric tablets from Giroft, labeled in linear Elamite, are not linguistic, but rather musical notation. That they represent a seven-note diatonic scale in whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, which starts on G if you're ascending or A if descending, with four additional black key notes to provide missing semitones, that they are therefore written for an 11-string harp or lyre, and that the composers strongly favored certain notes and certain intervals, and that these form recognizable, non-random, and pleasant-sounding structures. But I just used a bunch of words most of you have never heard, so let's back up. What is Elamite? It is an especially obscure language that was spoken in ancient Iran. I fell into a lore hole a few months ago, and I know a lot about Elamite now more than anyone ever needs to know. What is linear Elamite? It's an especially obscure writing system that was used by Elamite speakers, apparently as a local response to cuneiform that didn't succeed in replacing it. It died out. It is only partially understood, and there's an upcoming paper that explains more about it by Francois Desset, but it's apparently been delayed. And what is geometric? It refers to exactly three tablets that were dug up in Konar Sandal, Giraft, Iran, with some absolute nonsense carved on them, alongside labels in linear Elamite. That's why there's a connection to Elamite here. And their estimated origin is 2500 to 2000 BCE. So they're at least 4,000 years old. Here is a completely arbitrary example of what linear Elamite looks like. Very distinct appearance, as you can see. And then below that is just a sample of what geometric looks like, and you should be able to immediately spot the difference. Yes, they are both made from simple lines, but linear elamite is clearly much more complex and there's much more variety. But again, these are found on the same tablets. There are tablets that are filled with geometric on the front, and then they have like a word or two words in linear elamite on the back, presumably a label of some sort. Now here's a nice transcription so you can see the contents of all three tablets clearly. They are named Giroft, B prime, C prime, and D prime because they already ran through the whole alphabet once naming other tablets, but we'll just call them B, C, and D. I will draw your attention to the fact that on D, those scratch marks indicate where the tablet is too damaged to read the original characters and the gray highlight indicates where the text switches to linear Elamite, so that is not geometric, that is linear Elamite. Now, the leading expert in Elamite stuff is Francois de Sey, and you can read his paper, A New Writing System Discovered in 3rd Millennium BCE Iran, the Konar Sandal Geometric Tablets, if you would like more information, but in short, he identifies it as a separate writing system from linear Elamite, which is written in Bostrophedon style. If you do not know this word, it is Greek. It refers to the way an ox plows a field back and forth. So a writing system where the line direction alternates every line. He conjectures that it contains linguistic content as opposed to, say, math or being purely decorative and probably in a language other than Elamite, otherwise they'd presumably just use linear Elamite. And he guesses that the labels, which are on the back of two tablets and at the end on the front of the third, are signatures of the owners or someone agreeing to a contract. 
Now here is the symbol inventory per tablet. As you can see, they do not all have the exact same spread of symbols between them. And yes, I put them in a specific order for a specific reason, but we'll get there. One thing to note is what I will call the dot variant characters, which are identical to another character, except they have a dot in the middle. Real profound, I know. Problem. This is definitely not enough symbols. Even if we presume this is the world's first alphabet by quite a long time, rather than a syllabic system like other writing systems from the time, even if we presume it doesn't render vowels or something like that, this just isn't enough distinct symbols, especially for any language that we have any evidence for whatsoever in this quadrant of the planet. In particular, Tablet B contains just nine distinct symbols across almost a hundred characters, and one of them is clearly just a divider line because it delineates recurring patterns, so eight. There's only eight symbols on that tablet. And Tablet B doesn't contain any dot variant characters, which suggests that whatever difference it does indicate is not that important. It's not necessary for any common words. Okay, okay, but look at this sequence. Just think about it for a moment. Time's up. Here's a hint. One line, two lines, three lines. These are not phonemes. These are digits. It's not math. I could not find a way to make these out to be, say, addition or multiplication problems. If you do see a way, feel free to sound off in the comments. The highest digit apparently being seven is hard to explain, although an octal counting system is not impossible. We invented it for computers for some god's awful reason. There's no list of items included for which these would be counts or prices. There's a total lack of context. But there are some recurring patterns. And across all three tablets, there's exactly one instance of the same symbol twice in a row, which seems unlikely. But in the end, there's no clear reason you'd fill a bunch of tablets from top to bottom with hundreds of not random, but not arithmetic digits. Or is there? Now, what uses values one through seven in a repetitive, semi-structured manner? The diatonic scale. Now, now hold up, you are thinking, if you were paying attention. Because, sure, I identified a series of digit characters, each that has one more stroke than the last, giving a sequence 1 to 7. Very neat, very tidy. But there were a few other symbols on those tablets not included in the sequence. Is this the downfall of the hypothesis? No, it isn't. First up, let's talk about the vertical stroke, known to computer scientists everywhere as our friend the pipe character. The vertical stroke is a divider line, not a value. This is in accordance with its usage on some linear Elamite inscriptions, including the labels on these very tablets. We can be very confident because it delineates an extremely repetitive structure on tablet B, which I will show colorized on another slide. Spoilers, it looks like this. On tablet B, the measures between vertical strokes ranged from two to five symbols each, in line with syllables per word of spoken speech. On the other two, they both begin and end with several short measures, but have one very long measure in the middle, like on the order of 20, 25, something like that. I suspect these begin and end with notes set to lyrics with a pure instrumental section in the middle. 
the three tablets have different colors of clay and different finishes, so they were not made all in one batch and could have been made by people who didn't even know each other. Tablet B contains two symbols which do not appear on the other two tablets. We will call them V and Boat. Tablet B also lacks a symbol found on both other tablets, the X, and it lacks a symbol found on one of the other tablets. We'll call that Crown. I believe that V and X are the same value as written by two different people. This sort of minor variation is typical of linear Elamite practice. They could be very ornamental or have local designs. There is a lot of minor variety between the characters. At first, I thought boat and crown were also the same value as written by two different people, like just the boat's kind of not feeling it today, but it makes more sense to understand them as related but not the same when we get into how this system works. That leaves us with four symbols, which we will call oval, horseshoe, diamond, and boat. Now, diamond is clearly just a spicy square. It's the same four-sided shape drawn slightly differently. In that light, oval looks like an alternate circle and horseshoe looks like an alternate V. And that's when it became clear to me that boat is not a poorly written crown, but an alternate form of it. I will be honest, how I initially decided which is the main and which is the alternate version is just vibes and which symbol is more common. But what would be the use of alternate symbols for one, two, four, and five? My first thought was that they represent the next octave up or down, but this causes these specific notes to have very large awkward intervals, it would also be somewhat surprising if the instrument spanned two full octaves. My second idea was maybe they don't represent alternate tones, but the same tone played in a different way. This makes for a nice sounding transcription by modern western standards, but it felt unsatisfying as an explanation especially since the dot variant characters are more obviously a this is the same note but do something different indicator. So I kept looking. Third idea. We have a document that is written in both Sumerian and Akkadian describing the strings of a nine-stringed instrument, not from one to nine, but one, two, three, four, five in the middle, and then four, three, two, one. So there are two strings called the first string, two strings called the second string, the difference being one is front one, the other is back one, front two, back two, so on and so forth. However, if the middle note of this sequence is seven instead of five, then the intervals become even more implausibly large, not less. Additionally, I found it strange that three and six are very common values in the text, but there is no alternate three or alternate six. Fourth idea, semitones. Now, the predecessor of the most common modern tuning system was called Pythagorean tuning because it was allegedly invented by a Greek guy named Pythagoras. Well, he didn't invent it. The diatonic or Pythagorean tuning process is now known to have been cultivated in the ancient Near East from the old Babylonian period or earlier down through the last generations of the cuneiform scribal tradition. That's from the paper Diatonic Music in Greece, a reassessment of its antiquity by John Curtis Franklin. The oldest cuneiform documents about instrument tuning describe a Pythagorean scale containing whole tones and half tones, or semitones as they're also called. If you want to know more, Richard Dumbrill has written quite a lot. You will be busy for a long time. So if the white keys run to seven, then adding black keys would give us either 11 or 12 notes depending on where the scale starts. Now look at this. This is one of the lyres of Queen Pu'abi. It is the oldest substantially complete lyre in the world, and it is from the exact 
age range of our tablets around 2500 BCE. It had 11 strings. We know this because there are 11 attachments at the top, but to be clear, the strings themselves vaporized thousands of years ago, so it's not possible to say what exact tuning they had. This is one of the oldest quotes that we have on music theory. 11-stringed lyre with a 10-stepped arrangement. Hitherto all the Greeks played you heptatonic, summoning up a sparse muse. That is, Eon of Chios, who died in 422 BCE. Now, to be clear, there is a time gap here, equivalent to the entire history of Christianity. But it is very clear that he was referring to a lyre that is tuned in semitones, 11 semitones. And he is complaining that the Greeks will only use seven of them at a time on a heptatonic scale, and he finds this boring. This semitone hypothesis makes the numbers work out really well, far better than I was honestly expecting. Now, we will say that one prime is the semitone between the whole tones one and two, two prime between two and three, etc., If there are no semitones between 3 and 4, or between 6 and 7, then the scale can be very precisely identified as whole, whole, half, whole, whole, half, which is pleasingly symmetrical. This means starting on G if you are ascending, or starting on A if descending. According to Richard Dumbrill, the Akkadians called this scale the opening scale because it was the starting point in their tuning system. Here is a visualization of the scale on a piano, which should help you understand why we have two separate sets of numbers, 1 through 7, and then 1, 2, 4, and 5. It's not really possible to say if the scale goes up or down, so I have drawn it both ways. This is a segment of Tablet D that has been visualized in a MIDI tracker so that you can very clearly see the gentle curve of the melody here, a very regular curve. So this shows that 4 prime fitting neatly between 3 and 6 does look correct. Here's a little more circumstantial evidence. This is from the end of tablet C. It goes 1 prime, 4 prime, 7, 1, 4, 7, 1 prime, 4 prime, 7. And if you assume that 1 prime and 4 prime come after 1 and 4, then it makes a very clear pattern. Okay, but what about the dot variant? Uh, T-B-H-I-D-K. I suspect they indicate something about how the note is to be played, like shortly or rapid strumming, but your guess is as good as mine. One of the three tablets has no dot variants, one has a few, and one has many, which sounds like something that's stylistic rather than systematic. I am working under the assumption that they do not alter the tone. Good news, I have charts. Here is a frequency chart of how many times each character appears, including the vertical stroke as a character, combining V and X, and combining dot variants with their base forms. As you can see, there's an actually pretty distinct pattern here of high, low, 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 high, high, low, 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 high. Here's a diagram to try to visualize this better in terms of white and black piano keys. So we have two groups that each have two common white keys and one uncommon white key between them, and then black keys on either side of that. And then way at the end we have note 7, which is just forever alone. And note again that there is a half step between notes 3 and 4 where these two groups touch. Next, I charted the intervals of the songs. If you are not familiar with the term interval, it just means the distance between any two consecutive notes, how much higher or lower you are going as you move through the song. So this is measured in semitones without regard for direction. On the left, you see the intervals of the real songs, and on the right, you see the intervals of a randomly generated song of the same length. And as you can see, the real songs are decidedly not random. 
They have a special emphasis on four and five size intervals and de-emphasize the others. As a fair point of comparison, here is Bach's Little Fugue calculated the same way. There is much more emphasis on whole tones, but as you can see, there is the same general shape of most of it being towards the left end of the graph. And just for fun, here is Gourmet Race, also calculated the same way, because as you can see, it also has a heavy emphasis on the five semitone interval. Now, who are we all kidding? You want to hear the music. I will give you the music. As I mentioned, there is no indication of whether the scale is ascending the lowest note first or descending the highest note first, so I prepared it both ways, twice as much music. However, other ancient Middle Eastern systems seem to have been descending, so that may be the correct interpretation. I have given each note the same length. This is probably not accurate to how it would have been performed in practice. And the music has been rendered with a Pythagorean tuning, which does not make a big difference, but just that little extra touch of authenticity. Tablet B, Ascending. Tablet B, descending. Here is a very boring chart of tablet B transcribed to numerals by measure. By measure, I mean between two dividing lines. But I can make this a lot more interesting. Bam! Wow! Interesting. As you can see, there are highly structured repetitive patterns in this text, and there is an interesting curiosity. The measure 4-3 appears as the first measure then three measures after that, then six measures after that, then nine measures after that. That is very intentional. Okay, so tablet C is my favorite, so pay attention. Tablet C, ascending. Tablet C, descending. Here's another boring chart where I have colorized identical groups of four notes. 
I decided to treat like four and four prime as the same for the colorization purposes. The only really interesting thing here is that at the first pink group, the song noticeably changes tone. More interesting is this highly musical sequence of monotonically ascending and descending notes alternating with the bass tone. So like one, two, one, three, one, four, one, three, one, two, so on and so forth. Here's another colorized view broken down into groups of two notes that I think best shows the structure of this song. Tablet D, Ascending. Tablet D, Descending. Now, to be clear, this is very speculative and could be destroyed easily by better evidence about linear elamite, but I think the linear elamite label on this tablet represents the first few words of the song. If you look, the first two measures each only have one note in them. And one of the words is actually pretty readable. It says hunch, which means loved, like the verb. And I suspect that the first word is a single syllable name, and then after that comes a four syllable name. Compound names are very common in Elamite. So this could say so and so loved so and so. Tablet D has by far the least amount of identifiable structure in terms of like repeating patterns. However, it does follow very typical melodic contours up and down and up and down. In conclusion, it music. Okay, seriously though, I believe this is not just a music notation system, but an astonishingly straightforward and easy to understand one. It makes more visual sense than what everyone else got up to for the next several thousand years. I mean, I was able to figure it out with no context at all. The notated information makes sense as music, even across an incomprehensibly vast cultural gap. And if my hypothesis is correct, then this is both the oldest known music by many centuries and the oldest demonstration of a diatonic scale system. Wow. Here's where I stole all those photos from, and I must thank the Center for Decipherment for taking the time to make a complete linear Elamite font, including geometric, because let me tell you, no one else has. <laughs>